So welcome, good morning, good day, good evening to wherever you are. Um, this conversation today is related to the online advocacy event of IMAX, citizen-centered destinations and the future of business events on May 6. We are exploring what is happening in the policy-making world with some of the most innovative destinations and what this implies for aligning the interests of business events with the destination's policy-making priorities. This isn't about the pandemic specifically, but if the pandemic has changed priorities, has focused attention on particular challenges, has opened up new opportunities for competitive advantage, etc., then we would like to know and delve into this in these conversations. Now, my name is Kai Attendorf. I'm in my daytime job, the CEO of UFI, the Global Association of the Exhibitions Industry, and also volunteering as the president of the Joint Meetings Industry Council. It's my pleasure today to have a conversation with two esteemed colleagues from Singapore, Ginny and Ed. Why don't I ask you two to introduce yourselves first as well? Ginny, why don't we start with you? Thank you very much, Kai. So as you have introduced, uh, my name is Jeannie Lim. I'm the Assistant Chief Executive of the Policy and Planning Group at the Singapore Tourism Board. Uh, in my role, basically, I oversee all policy and planning matters, including strategy, um, the regulatory frameworks, uh, and the various other policy-related matters surrounding the tourism sector um, and over under the purview of the Singapore Tourism Board or STB. That's great. Ed, you're also with the STB, right? Yes, uh, it's Kai. Uh, so I'm Edward. I'm the Executive Director at the Singapore Exhibition and Convention Bureau, and I deal largely with conventions, meetings, and incentive travel. Great. So we have the policy side and the business side here today. And why are we talking to Singapore colleagues? Um, now, Singapore has been a trendsetter and leader in terms of linking business events to the broader policy goals for at least two decades. But spend more time focusing on the future direction, we want to look today at how Singapore aims to remain ahead of the pack. And that brings us to our first main topic today, which is about setting policies during a global pandemic, the challenges and priorities, and how have they changed today compared to the time before the pandemic. And essentially, the one item that struck my mind preparing this conversation is that trust and reliability are so huge success factors, both in the events industry and in policy making. You need trust to be mandated to do an event. You need trust to be mandated to implement a policy. Now, the pandemic forces us to break out of our usual mode and, and review how we do things and what holds up and what needs to be changed to respond to the changing circumstances beyond our control. So for me, one of the big questions I want to get to you too about is how do we balance these priorities of agility in responding to new needs, a new situation, and reliability to maintain that trust? It's a big question to start with. Ginny, you want to take it? Yes, thanks, Kai. Uh, so I think you raised two very important aspects um, that are very important during a, a global pandemic. So agility and reliability, and definitely how to engender trust. Um, and these were also key points for us in Singapore. Uh, one of the first few things within the government um, was actually the formation or setting up of the multi-ministry task force. Uh, and that's where ministers from the various uh, different ministries actually came together um, very regularly to really come together to discuss what the latest updates were surrounding COVID-19 and what were all the pertinent matters under each various ministry um, that and where decisions had to be made. Uh, so a lot of times the decisions was not made unilaterally, but really at this multi-ministry task force. And how that decision-making kind of filtered down um, basically to us and, and our sector really was the formation within STB of what we call a, a Tourism Recovery Action Task Force. So we gathered together the leaders of all the various uh, tourism-related industry associations very early on. Um, so since as early as February last year, so over a year ago now, we set up this 
committee and we basically got industry representatives to come on board with us and to basically get regular feedback and updates um, both ways. So between us and the private sector and the companies and the industry, as well as from them to us. And we would then take these feedback um, and suggestions and any concerns that they had raised uh, towards the, the multi-ministry task force and we would put the decisions up to the multi-ministry uh, task force to be made. And so in that sense, uh, that enabled us to, to move quite, uh, uh, I guess, quickly. We managed to be quite agile in the way that we were doing things as well, but yet in a way that engendered trust because we did it um, bearing in the feedback and, and the ground sentiments as well, which is very important to us. And I think the ministers appreciated that uh, because then they could get a very quick update of what the business sentiments were, how um, what were the challenges faced by companies? What were some of the key concerns? And the feedback from the industry was then used to formulate um, the, evol the, the evolving policies as we moved on as well. And we took very much what we would call a, a risk a calibrated risk approach. I think right from the start, we knew that Singapore we've always been a very open economy. So as much as we had to make difficult decisions at times to close borders uh, or to ask companies to 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 shut down, um, to to you know to stop the spread of the of the of, of the virus of, of COVID nineteen, uh, we wanted to ensure that you know we moved in a sense that still allowed some businesses to continue as much as possible uh, to keep the economy uh, ticking as well, which was very important. We didn't want a, a complete shutdown um, because that would cost us dearly in, in over the longer term too. So very much a calibrated risk approach rather than a, a, a zero risk tolerance, I think was kind of the approach that we took. Yeah, Ed, and I remember an outcome of that approach is that you fairly early on already started hosting trial events again in Singapore. Yes, Kai, we started quite early in October. Um, you, can, you can say it's, a, it's, it's really a long journey of um, building trust and credibility, a long but, but totally necessary. Uh, so for, for Singapore's mice industry, uh, we focus on, the, like Jeannie mentioned, we focus on the resumption of uh, business event in a safe and sustainable manner. And as you mentioned, since 1st October, we've started to receive uh, events applications, MICE event applications for up to 250 attendees under our safe business events framework. And, and if you, you might remember uh, November last year, we held our very first travel trade show that took place physically um, and during COVID-19 with a total of uh, slightly more than a thousand local and foreign attendees and exhibitors and we had a great pipeline of event pilots uh, thereafter um, a significant step forward as compared to last year when when no business events were allowed uh, to take place uh, important uh, uh, principle principle we adopted is that uh, we adopted testing over uh, quarantine so for example attendees uh, must undergo the uh, digital rapid test, uh, we call it pre-event testing for, for many of our events, large-scale business events, prior to the commencement uh, of the event. Uh, it was trial at Travel Revive, it was trial at the Singapore International Energy Week at the PCMA convening leaders uh, earlier in January this year. Uh, uh, we found it to be quite effective, uh, efficient because results were out in about 30 minutes and valid for 24-hour 20, time frame. Uh, so since then, now it's uh, April, we have traveled over 50 miles so far, uh, including a few international events with foreign visitors. And these events are very important for us to collect data, to uh, collect insights, which help guide us to prepare for a larger resumption of mice events. Um, and this include tracking the type and the duration of interactions between delegates and whether safe distancing measures can be implemented effectively. Um, in fact, most recently, uh, we announced uh, in end March that the capacity limits uh, for MICE events uh, will be increased to 750 uh, attendees, in fact, from 24th April, I think, which is next week onwards. Uh, so attendees will have to be split into zones of up to 50 uh, each and safe distancing uh, has to be observed. So we we'll continue to build on our credibility, reliability and all these build trust. 
Yes, and I can I can I can speak to that because um, Singapore was my first long haul destination uh, since the pandemic started. I came to came to travel with my friend. Uh, I think your colleagues told me at the airport that I was one of the first international trade visitors back in the country, um, and I, I can tell you. For sure, I felt I felt safe all the way, and uh, you made sure that I could feel safe with the uh, testing over quarantine schemes in place. And um, not only did we have a successful event, um, we also could prove the point that business can come back, and there are ways to operate safely throughout the pandemic. So um, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that by now you've been able to scale up these numbers again. And um, this is about that giving that reliability and giving that uh, giving that confidence that events will will resume. So kudos to you uh, and everyone involved for doing that. Um, I would li like to move on to our second main theme, which is um, to delve a little bit deeper into policy areas that have the most relevance for the business event sector, now, including those that are not necessarily immediately seen as such. Uh, this can be about digitization, it can be about inward investment over knowledge economy, whatever you want to touch on. Um, because again, I think we've had this conversation on various policy events for many years before the pandemic, to go beyond the economic impact, to look at the impact on society, on the amount of knowledge generated around business events. Um, but I think here the pandemic really serves as a black swan event in a positive way potentially as well, because if we turn that thought upside down and look at the unexpected opportunities and the unseen benefits for business events coming out of the pandemic from policy making, there are probably some, some new opportunities. So what's it you're seeing taking shape in Singapore? Edward, you want to start this time? Uh. Sure, happy to do so. Um, I think now we are in a stage where we are actually all no longer amateurs at uh, Skype and, and Zoom and all these uh, virtual uh, instruments at our, you know, at our disposal. Uh, in fact, all these, we call it the global acceleration of remote working, of virtual events, has altered the form of business travel. You know it well. It's, firstly, it's very hard to travel these days, but I see more opening out of lanes. Um, so, Obviously, we're seeing more hybrid events coming about, and we all know it combines the uh, digital and the virtual conference delivered to uh, into a unified experience. Um, the example I'll, I'll, I'll give is, for example, Marina Bay Sands, one of the first venue to uh, come out the hybrid event broadcast studio in Singapore, a new state-of-the-art um, hybrid event broadcast studio that allows industry to experience both mice and leisure events in very innov innovative ways. Uh, we know dimensional. We saw the uh, very impressive uh, backdrop. So, experience for the delegates was it's a lot better. So today we have received a uh, very positive feedback on the technology and safety protocol in place at hybrid conferences. Um, we are already home to a number of tech startups and businesses that could facilitate the pivoting from business uh, uh, events, physical business events to virtual ones. Uh, in fact, in today's uh, papers, uh, we were informed that uh, the number of medtech uh, startups has doubled since 21.4. Uh, this is one of the trends that we're seeing these days. Um, certain technologies like uh, live video streaming, no longer new, but most technology platforms in this sector uh, continue to design to support live events. Um, I think we all also know that hybrid conferences provide alternative platforms for those who are, able to, who are not able to travel. Um, a, a good reference point is, for example, PCMA uh, uh, this year. We were able to invite top speakers, Thomas Friedman, the opening uh, uh, Julia Gillard, uh, former um, uh, Australian Prime Minister, uh, for, the, for, for, the, for the end session. Uh, and Singapore as the global broadcast centre. Uh, we also know that there are associations now reaching out to even more members and non-members using this virtual outreach tool. So I would say that the opportunities uh, are immense. Thank you. So, uh, in many ways, Singapore has become a TV studio for the world of, of meetings, right? <laughs> Ginny, um, over to the to the to the broader policy side, because um, I think you're, you're, you've looked a lot into providing support to mice companies to to pivot to these hybrid events to facilitate these changes. 
Yes, Kai, thanks. Um, you know, actually, the, 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 the Chinese characters for, for crisis is Wei Ti, uh, meaning danger uh, and opportunity. Uh, so you very, very rightly pointed out that there's indeed opportunity in every crisis and we definitely um, don't want to let this crisis go to waste. Uh, so we've been looking at different ways to help companies to pivot, like you say. Uh, some of them have had to pivot to very different business models. Uh, and how we support them is really through different um, grants, different subventions, different schemes, um, as well as providing them um, manpower support through the enhanced job support scheme. Uh, which have continued to give to the tourism uh, related companies to basically help to hold on and retain their their, their local talent um, during this difficult period where revenues are, are scarce and hard to come by. Uh, so by taking care of some of the key cost items, uh, we help the companies to really pull through and sustain. Uh, and then we also give them different grants and uh, to support their training, their upskilling, in some of these type of uh, activities because you know uh, someone who is very used to physical events might need to to go for quite a bit of training before they can completely pivot uh, to some of these hybrid uh, virtual type of events or, or actually start working with uh, different technology companies different audio technicians and engineers so on and so forth uh, so we do have a whole slew of different support schemes to, to help the companies uh, to undertake through that. And we also provide quite a bit of funding support, um, basically because we understand that during this time when we are still piloting MICE events and business events in different formats, uh, you know, sometimes there is cost incurred in applying some of the safe management measures. Uh, and so we, we do want to try and help to offset some of these uh, costs as well. And that's very much true what we call our uh, business improvement fund. Uh, on the other hand, you know, no matter how much cost you subsidize, you still need to drive some form of revenue. So when we work with these uh, business events companies, we look at what would help them to uh, drive their, their top line numbers as well. Um, how to cater and reach out to a wider audience. Uh, we help them through uh, what we call a marketing partnership program to basically uh, launch different marketing programs, be it to stay in touch with their customers, uh, their key clientele, or to launch various um, advertising and promotional campaigns or to attract people to some of the events that they might be organizing. Uh, and then, of course, very importantly, we like like how you said you came into Singapore. I think we are a very strong advocate for facilitating business travel into Singapore to attend some of the business events that are being piloted, that are being uh, organized and held in Singapore. Uh, so that actually we, we have to drive some of these uh, physical numbers as well, physical attendees uh, to the business events that, that do actually take place here in Singapore. Um, one other, I suppose, kind of scheme that we have come up with, it was really an opportunistic time to come up with this, was really an inbound insurance coverage scheme. Um, so prior to that, uh, I think, you know, there wasn't really uh, insurance coverage for people who would have contracted COVID-19 uh, or would have uh, some of the costs incurred in terms of doing the various tests or should they need to be hospitalized or be quarantined. Uh, so we work with the General Insurance Association and various insurance companies together with the industry uh, to launch a few programs in the market today that will help to provide this insurance cover. So this, uh, we believe, gives um, travelers and visitors coming in um, peace of mind, knowing that, uh, you know, that should anything happen, uh, the cost will, will be taken care of by the insurance coverage. Uh, so those are some of the, I suppose, innovations that we've come up with um, during this crisis uh, to turn it into opportunities that we believe will also continue to be valid over the longer term. Thank you for sharing that because I believe right now it is also important to drive these communities that hold these meetings to not give up on the physical, even though in some parts of the world we are fighting third waves, second waves, fourth waves, depending on how you're counting. And still for many parts of the world that digital connection conversation like we are having it here now is still very much the only opportunity to have conversations at least across continents. Um, at the same time, the impression I got in Singapore Travel Revive just as well as last week when I was in the US for the first time again for an industry conference is that the moment you have an opportunity to bring people back together face to face, everybody is jumping at it. 
And so all that support that makes it possible for people to come with the testing over quarantine regulations, with the bubbles, uh, with the funding support to empower and enable the organizers to hold these events. It is right now a super important element in this way back to life. Uh, we are having our first UFI event again in May and the uh, response is enthusiastic. People simply want to come back to meet face to face and to have this human connection beyond that digital reach. And uh, broadcasting is a great tool, but it is a poor cousin, so to say, of, of the physical context, which, which brings me to my, my next topic, because ultimately policy making business events are here to serve the needs of communities. And the community of a destination are its citizens. So um, I know that Singapore's founder, Lee Kuan Yew, noted that Singapore's only natural resource is its people. And um, in what ways are business events then seen as a means of strengthening and expanding local human capital? So how important is this citizen-centered approach in policy making to these policy areas that drive, that drive business events? Let's, so let's connect what we do as an industry with what's in it <clears throat> for the people of Singapore through events. Uh, Ed, I see you taking a deep breath, so why don't we watch you go first? <laughs> okay, uh, no, we, we, Kai, like, like what you mentioned, we, we all know that the business events, uh, it's not just for the benefits of the uh, business events industry, but just people employed uh, in the industry and its amplifying effect is um, is widely documented and benefits goes way beyond just direct uh, economic ones. Um, our my strategy uh, sees us aspiring to grow quality content by driving a vibrant and distinctive business events landscape through clustering of programs. And this will involve supporting events that reinforce Singapore's thought leadership association and destination profiling uh, with events such as GIFT. And we continue to support conf uh, confectors at the Singapore Festival, which combines knowledge sharing, commercial sustainability, and also business networking. And what we really want to do is establish Singapore as an ideal business events destination with conducive pro-business environment. We're obviously strong government support. And also we're trying to uh, establish ourselves as the marketplace and gateway to the region, to Southeast Asia, to Asia. And we continue to have thought leadership association at high profile events and strive to have large international presence at events or at least first in Asia concepts. So our, our priorities are quite clear. We need to support our local stakeholders in re-pivoting or pivoting towards new opportunities and, and business areas such as virtual and hybrid events and re redesigning business models and strengthening key capabilities of our people. So we encourage our industry to on our existing and enhanced training schemes to enhance the skills of our employees, uh, like you mentioned, our only natural resources, and to rethink their existing business models and uh, operational processes. Um, Jeannie mentioned a couple of uh, schemes uh, earlier on. You know, one of the, the rather important schemes is our job, job support scheme, uh, GSS in short. Uh, uh, rolled out last year, uh, provided which support to employers to help them retain their local employees. And these payouts uh, were intended to offset local employees' wages, help protect their jobs. And this is our focus, our only natural resource. Yeah, so human capital is definitely, uh, you know, a, a very important aspect uh, for us. Um, and I think a critical uh, part of, of our strategy is very much sustainability. And, and that is something I think we have uh, announced uh, quite recently at our tourism ministry conference that we want to look at in a much broader destination um, approach, uh, not just at hotels or at the event or company level, but really collectively at, at, at an industry level. So it covers environmental sustainability, uh, economic sustainability, and in social uh, as, as aspects as well. Uh, so we want to con continue to make sure that, you know, the jobs that the business events industry generates uh, continue to remain relevant um, to us. 
And very much our mind strategy, as Edward has mentioned, is to be a, a global Asian node, right, for business events and, and business visitors. Uh, so in order to, to do that, uh, you know, we do need um, the business events to be able to enable that exchange of knowledge, uh, that exchange of intellectual capacity um, that will benefit uh, the companies and the people in Singapore as well. Uh, we work very closely with our conference ambassadors. I think even during this time, many of them remain active uh, in terms of engaging with us, as well as feeding in what are the key concerns or key developments within their respective uh, industries, so that we ensure that uh, their, their event planning, um, be it in the near term or the longer term, be it uh, virtual, online, or, or hybrid or physical, continues to have relevant content and, and formats as well. Uh, we have also begun to roll out vaccinations in a very big way in Singapore. So uh, vaccinations in Singapore is highly encouraged for everyone. It's readily available uh, and it's made free of charge to all residents in Singapore. So I think we've been fairly successful. Uh, we've started off with the higher risk groups and the more senior citizens. Uh, and we are rolling that out in phases. And so far, I think we are gaining good traction. And so right now we are reviewing the policies to say that, okay, we, should we get to a certain stage where a large majority of the population are vaccinated? How can we then further relax some of the measures that are surrounding the way we do events, the way we um, uh, formulate uh, policies uh, regarding um, safe management measures? Uh, but safety of our people and our visitors, I think, always remains a top priority. And we make that very clear as well. Um, and of the staff, because sometimes, you know, the staff running the events, the staff at the hotels or at the venues and the convention centers, they also have concerns. And so we must have very rigorous um, processes and frameworks in place. We make sure that the, the venues are well trained to handle any emergency or crisis should it happen. Um, and we uh, always vet through all the emergency crisis plans um, prior to the events happening to ensure that they're all ready um, and prepared and know that uh, safety comes first and foremost. Uh, and that helps to allay a lot of the, the fears and the concerns. Uh, and I think it helps to better uh, bolster a very strong uh, human capital for the business events industry. That's that's so encouraging to hear, to hear especially around the vaccination numbers, because I, I hear similar stories now from, from more and more of the major destinations around the world. And again, um, in, in the US, um, people are meeting again and they're reopening the industry uh, with more vaccinations having been rolled out and more vaccinations are being available throughout Europe. So the vaccination rates are going up and the UK will reopen and the Middle East is open. And uh, I'm, I'm really hoping that we have most of that dark period behind us and we can resume to a mix of people that have been vaccinated, that have been tested negative, or that actually uh, overcame a COVID infection and, and some kind of standardized certification slash passport slash document that will uh, ease the international travel to allow us all to connect again. Um, I, I want to move on and figure out how business events can help you as a destination to shape future policy making. Uh, where can experts coming in, where can events you're organizing and holding on site, online, hybrid, help you figure out the way ahead? Um, and what are destination strategies related to that, to tap into that kind of global intelligence of experts to help Singapore moving on after the pandemic? Jeannie, you want to take this one first again? Yeah, so I'll go first. Um, thanks, Kai. So in November, um, STB announced a, a new initiative to reimagine travel for Singapore and the rest of the world um, by sparking conversations, stories and ideas uh, to collectively shape the future of our sector. So this campaign is called Singapore Reimagines and the platform kicks off with Singapore Reimagined Travel Global Conversations, uh, which is basically a series of forums around the world to catalyze uh, discussions on how to reshape global travel uh, so I think we want to take the initiative to trigger these type of conversations on how people see um, customer sentiments changing and evolving regarding travel. <clears throat> so following all these conversations, we will share our learnings on how the public and private sector have 
come together to reshape um, global travel. And that's something we are quite excited to share about. Um, no, I just, just want to add on to, 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 to Ginny's point. Uh, just, just an example. So, so, for example, the Singapore Association of uh, Convention and Exhibition Organizers and Suppliers, call it SASIOS in short, uh, we launched the um, certification program on the 7th of April. Uh, we call it the Safe Events Certification Program. Uh, this is really to ensure hygiene benchmarks, safe distancing best practices, to ensure that events are, can progressively resume uh, in Singapore. And we see this course as something that's relevant, ju not just for the mines industry, but for, for the wider industry, for even, even for, for retail, even for, you know, related to the environment. Um, and this uh, certification program uh, launched by MICE, the uh, Industry Association, basically is based on technical reference that was developed by the Singapore Standards Council and overseen uh, by Enterprise Singapore. And this provides best practices for conducting events safely and responsibly and beyond just complying with government mandated safe management measures. And it's really based on events industry resilience roadmap released by SASIOS uh, in October uh, 2020. Um, and, and another thing I'd like to just, just highlight, um, probably uh, some of you might be familiar with the quality mark of excellence called um, the Singapore Clean. Um, this is this is that um, logo with the green smiley emoji uh, you, might, you might be familiar with. It's a whole effort uh, to rally businesses and the public to uphold high standards of sanitation and hygiene. Uh, we call it the National Mark of Excellence that indicates our business commitment to adhere to high standards of environmental public hygiene uh, on the premises. Uh, this quality mark is awarded to an establishment only after it has been assessed and certified by a qualified third party assessor. And uh, to today, I think we have more than um, 20,000 individual premises, including hotels and our uh, mice venues in Singapore already uh, SG Clean, uh, SG Clean certified. Um, I think finally, I just want to add that, you know, probably not the, the World Economic Forum special uh, annual meeting 2021 is coming to Singapore, uh, really only the second time it has moved out of uh, Switzerland in its, uh, um, I think it's 50 years of existence. Um, and obviously, as mentioned earlier, PCMA uh, convening leaders 2021 also held in Singapore uh, for the first time in 64 years. And I think this relocation of this event to Singapore uh, affirms our spot as a safe and leading mice destination. Yes, we've noticed. I mean, something like the World Economic Forum moving to Singapore, PCMA, um, relying on Singapore to do something that um, they obviously didn't feel confident to do in the US. It's, it's quite something to put to put Singapore on the spot as a, as a world-class destination to respond to such changes and challenges. Um, which brings me to the kind of um, final part of our conversation, the secret sauce question. Um, now, obviously, we are all in this together. So uh, if you could please share your top three secrets uh, to, with, with the global community on how you can align these business event strategies to position Singapore as the uh, virtual and hybrid mice hub, for instance, with the policy priorities. So what is there that you feel confident to share with the global community watching at, us here at IMAX as, to, as they review their policies going forward? Ginny, so the secret sauce, please. Well, I'm not sure if it's a secret sauce, uh, but really I would put it down to the three major points. The first being communication. So I think communication is always key in any crisis uh, and, and it's two-way communication, not just one-way communication. Uh, so, you know, communication on policies from us to the industry and the private sector and feedback and, and concerns, uh, as well as communication from the private sector to the government that can then help us to reshape the policies. Uh, number two would really be agility. I think what we started off this whole um, session with, uh, when you mentioned right at the start, Kai, uh, I think within a crisis, agility remains very important. Um, and the third is, of course, a, a trust. I think when the, we can work together, where there's open and, and good communication, uh, when we are willing to evolve policies along the way, depending on the situation, um, but yet have a consistent framework so people don't feel that we're wishy-washy, um, but yet there's some 
flexibility, I think that helps to engender trust. And once there is trust, I think, you know, the really, um, there's so much to gain for, for, from that. I think really that's where uh, future business events can really take off uh, because that's where the best policies come in place to support the growth and the flourishing of the business events industry. Ed. Well, uh, I think it's it's always a, a, a multilateral way of uh, sharing wisdom. It's, it's ne never one way. Uh, so uh, we, we all share our secret sources, uh, but just, just to share something, maybe not, not overly secret. There was a brand health study uh, conducted across 14 markets, uh, conducted by an appointed uh, research company in, in August. They revealed that leisure and BT mice travelers maintain a strong perception of Singapore being a safe destination to visit uh, despite COVID-19. So that's very reassuring. Uh, we know that we always had this this brand of being green and clean. I think this is uh, this is coming through. Um, and according to the study, confidence in traveling overseas for leisure and business events uh, has been steadily increasing. 76% uh, of leisure travelers and 90% of BT mice uh, travelers indicated they are likely to travel in the next uh, few months if at all possible. Uh, I think that the second point is really that we are also watching closely and working closely uh, with our colleagues in the health ministry uh, on the possibility of having a differentiated travel protocol for vaccinated travelers. Um, and this health policy stance, I think will have a huge impact on the business events industry. And I think everyone's watching closely uh, on what uh, could be announced uh, in the coming months. And finally, I think we are continuing to work with event planners to reimagine all the possibilities as we have seen some uh, so far on the future of MICE events, physical, hybrid, and how we can make them successful. Um, and we want to be part of this success by working hard to collect insights, collecting data points to ensure we understand what works, what doesn't work, what is culture viable or viable, what is not. And that will help everyone to resume events uh, in Singapore in a safe and trusted manner. Thank you. So it seems we are we are well on the way to reach that famous light at the end of the tunnel to to get to that new dawn of that new or maybe not so new normal of, of business events and policy making on the other side of COVID. Now I know that Singapore has many bilateral agreements in place to facilitate travel into the country. Um, I know you are working with IATA on the travel passport scheme, on the vaccinations passport schemes. So um, what is your, if, if, you, if you get the big crystal ball out in, in wrapping up uh, this conversation, for, again, for the benefit of the global IMAX community, uh, where do you think we will be as an industry uh, 12 months from now in, in your part of the world and globally? Yeah, so, so maybe, maybe I'll, I'll address that first. Um, I think, you know, if you look at some of IATA's projections um, and, and projections by the UN World Tourism Organization as well, uh, they're only expecting uh, travel and tourism to get back to pre-COVID levels really um, by 2023-2024. Uh, so the rest of this year, we've basically told uh, our, our industry to, to just you know, buckle down and it's going to be tough and challenging for this year. As much as we are in discussions with various jurisdictions on um, having some air travel bubbles, I think we, we also uh, want to proceed quite conservatively. So the next 12 months will continue to be challenging, but I think with vaccinations becoming more widespread uh, and hopefully if, if more and more countries um, get the, the COVID-19 pandemic under control within their communities, this will help to, to trigger, um, I suppose, the recovery uh, and the trust as well in the various systems um, and the flexibility to be able to travel to and fro. And, and hopefully that will help to then restart the, the whole business events um, economy uh, globally, not just in Singapore and Asia, but globally. And so we, we remain optimistic always. I think we're always uh, cautious, cautiously optimistic. We do still have plans for several events um, stage, uh, I guess, in a safe way uh, for the rest of this year, uh, not just after 12 months. And we hope to scale that up, of course, um, as uh, vaccinations get underway. And, and hopefully, like you say, uh, we sort of hopefully put the pandemic behind us at some point. 
Thank you. Ed, where will we where will we be six months from now, twelve months from now? Except obviously all of us will have to be in Singapore at some point. Yeah, that, that sounds good for me. All of us in Singapore, but uh, we we we've heard uh, that the IMAX uh, Vegas and then IBTM World will you know will will resume at the end of the year. So I think that's that's, that's wonderful news. Um, that that signal uh, increased confidence in people being able to to travel to uh, business events um, in a very safe, uh, responsible manner. If not international, at least regional uh, travel. Um, I think if we were to extrapolate uh, the vaccination rates, and I think we should be able to hit, hit uh, you know, this immunity for, for some countries that are a little bit ahead of the curve. And I think if, if ever two countries that have uh, reached a high level of vaccination were able to start a travel bubble uh, i think that that's uh, is is a signal and also an experiment for others to follow suit and and maybe uh, explore other ways of making um, uh, cross-border travel possible so like you mentioned i think the new dawn we hope it comes sooner and uh, light hopefully getting brighter as we move towards the tunnel thanks thanks ed thanks jenny and indeed um, i can't wait to have the same conversation with both of you again, face to face uh, in Singapore at IMAX, wherever this industry takes us. And uh, thanks both of you for your time. Um, thanks to everyone watching and listening on demand. I hope you found this conversation useful. And I guess we'll all see you on that digital IMAX platform around this time. So thanks again, Ginny. Thanks again, Edward. Thank you very much, Kai. Thank you to IMAX. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ed.